800 years ago, the bones of saints and martyrs all over Europe found new homes. The greatest building boom the world had ever seen had just exploded across medieval Europe. All over the continent, work began on vast cathedrals that towered 14 stories high, higher than any structures Europe had seen before. But nobody knows exactly how they were built. It's now believed that the cathedral builders developed some of the most advanced machinery of the age, amazing medieval cranes driven by giant tread wheels. With the help of these cranes, more stone was used to build these Gothic structures than the Egyptians used in all the pyramids. In France alone, they built 80 cathedrals and tens of thousands of churches so that by the end of the Gothic period in Europe they had about uh, one church for every 200 inhabitants. 800 years later, an international team have come together to try to work out how these giant cranes were built. Julian Weaver has come to Salisbury Cathedral to study the giant wheel that was used for lifting stone to the top of the tower. Julian normally designs film sets out of polystyrene, but now he's planning to build the ultimate medieval crane. This crane that we're going to build is going to last thousands of years, I hope. You know, some of the timbers hopefully will last as long as some of these. The same materials. Whereas normally the stuff I build only lasts a day and a half and I chuck it in the skip. So it's all over and done with and it's gone. At last we meet, sir. Julian, how are you doing? Oh, very well. Finally, what a place to meet at, though, oh, huh? Yeah. This is gorgeous. Just like medieval cathedral builders, Julian has no formal engineering training. So Bashar Altabar, a British trained structural engineer from Boston, will make sure his design is going to work. This is impressive. I mean, it's very helpful to see what they've done but uh, it's kind of a little bit limited. This can only move stones up and down. I'm pretty sure we can do a lot better than that. Nobody knows exactly what medieval cranes looked like. There are no plans. All Julian and Bashar have to go on are medieval illustrations. There are a lot of interesting paintings and um, manuscripts um, about all these cranes that artists were just drawing um, during a construction of cathedrals. I mean, look at this one. Medieval illustrations depict many types of crane. Simple pulleys to lift buckets of mortar. Small hand winches to raise stones. But one type of crane rises above all others. It uses a tread wheel to lift heavy masonry. What, what, what do you fancy out of all iron, this? Iron. This is my favorite crane. I think this one gives us. Why? It has all the elements. Has the wheel, has the ability to rotate 360 degrees. It gives us almost a complete crane. You think you can build one of those to carry a ton? Yeah, I don't see why not. Julian has to design a crane that will lift one ton, the weight of the largest stones in a medieval cathedral. They're artists' impressions. We don't know about scale. This may not have even existed. This might have been out of the ma imagination of the artist that painted it. So this is all we've got to go from. From his drawings, Julian has built a one-tenth size wooden model. He's working from intuition, just like medieval carpenters. The head carpenter would have, would have made this, and um, experience would have told them what worked, what didn't work. And if it had broken, they would have built another one and modified it, and so on and so on, over generations. Some would have collapsed, some would have fallen over, some would have killed people. It would have been through trial and error. Julian plans to build the crane in three sections, the base, the jib arm, and the wheel. This is six metres high. It's a beast. Julian is going to build his crane in Normandy. It was in this part of France that the Gothic building boom exploded onto Europe 800 years ago. 
They will build their crane next to the medieval abbey of Ombi. Its 30 meter tower will give a sense of scale. Back in 1200, this would have been a building site and a crane would have been used to construct the tower. Julian's order of timber arrives at the abbey. Whew. God, until you get up here, you don't realize how much wood is here. Straight, we've got a lot of wood. Tons and tons of it. It's the biggest Meccano set I've ever had in my life. To help assemble his giant Meccano set, Julian has pulled together an international team of eight carpenters and two blacksmiths. The team's challenge is to turn Julian's model into reality. None of them have ever built a medieval crane before, but they're used to working with very, very large timbers, building houses and what have you. They start with the base. Oh, boy. I'm exhausted already. I only moved three timbers. Three tons of timber have to be joined together to provide a solid support for the rest of the crane. Seeing the, the tools that they use, the implements, the size of the chisels, some of the hammer sizes, ginormous hammers. I'm very, very pleased. I'm delighted how well we've done. The guys are just so quick, they're just banging it out. As far as possible, they will use medieval techniques. This is to prove that the square pegs go through a round door. The joints will be held together with wooden pegs. Each timber is marked out in the traditional way. Basically, they're marking up the timbers so we know which bit goes together because it's going to be disassembled, then reassembled. That's 2-9 from there to there. Oh, God help us. I'm working in uh, metric now, huh? Right. Bashar is on site to check progress on the design. H how do you know that this is a 30-60 and this is 90? He's greeted with a surprise. Instead of using dried oak, the team are using freshly cut or green wood. The green oak is heavier than dried, kiln, kiln dried oak because of the amount of moisture in it. The extra weight spells danger. Bashar fears for the stability of the crane. It could jeopardize his calculations. In medieval times, the need for large, powerful cranes came from a radical change in architecture. At the beginning of the 12th century, the prevailing architectural style across Western Europe was Romanesque. Dr. Alexandra Gajewski is an architectural historian who specializes in French medieval architecture. You would enter into a kind of gloomy atmosphere because of the lack of light. Gloomy that, of course, for the Middle Ages, we have to imagine illuminated by candles. It's quite a mysterious, dark atmosphere. In this abbey church of Saint-Denis in Paris, one man, Abbot Suger, started an architectural revolution. When he became abbot, Suger inherited a problem. His abbey of Saint-Denis was one of the most important religious sites in Europe. It was the last resting place of the kings of France. It was also home to the nation's most holy relic, the remains of Saint-Denis, the patron saint of Paris. But the church was very small. There was not enough space at Saint-Denis. And Suji tells us that when the pilgrims were coming to visit the relics, that women were trodden on their knees and had to be lifted to walk on the shoulders of men to the east to see the relics. Suger decided to enlarge the church and pioneered a new style. We know that Abu Suger was interested in having walls of continuous windows which would illuminate the church with colored light. This was one of his passions. But the other effect of doing that is that you break open your wall space, that the interior becomes skeletal. 
And so you end up with a different architecture. With an architecture of a different character and aesthetic. Almost single-handedly, Abu Suje invented the Gothic style. The result was radically different from everything that had gone before. The high-ribbed vaults, pointed arches and large windows would become the hallmark of the new Gothic architecture. It must have been stunning. It must have been completely overwhelming. Nothing quite like it had been seen before. As Gothic cathedrals grew higher, a new type of crane was needed to reach the heavens. The next day at Ombi, the timber framers have finished making the base of the crane. The soft green oak chosen by Julian is much easier to cut than hard, seasoned oak. So work is progressing well. On three, two, three. Now yeah, I'm right here. Gonna roll it. To you a bit. That's it. To you a bit. But for Bashar, the decision to use green oak is a cause for concern. While the rest of the team presses on regardlessly, Bashar's green timber blues are putting him on edge. He takes away a sample of green oak for further study. Excuse me. Um, you, you have um, scale, you know, uh, put this, wow. yeah, you have sca scale, scale, uh, balance, you have got balance, oh, can I put this on the balance, okay, it's almost completely saturated, very wet, so we were very concerned about how heavy it's going to get. If this were dry wood, it would weigh eight kilos, but eight kilos of sugar are already on the scales. Seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? It's very heavy. Okay, thank you. The crane has a very heavy wheel attached to it. And it's basically the counterweight. The biggest problem I have is the stability and the strength of this crane when the wheel is on before it carries any load. This is about one and a half times heavier than I thought it would be. Instead of a one ton wheel, the crane will now have a wheel weighing one and a half tons. When I first saw your initial concept, um, the biggest concern I had was the weight of the wheel. Um, there are two things that can happen. One, the whole thing can literally tip back and mm -hmm. fall. The other thing, it could actually break right at the center here, mm -hmm. uh, where it's the weakest. I mean, it, it can literally snap in here. This is a mighty piece of timber, though. You're yeah. looking at... We're 14 by 14 now, right? Yeah, it's, you know, it's... Yeah, that's huge. The timber framers are not concerned about the weight of the wheel. Ready? It's gonna drop. In fact, they want to make it bigger. Ready? They think Julian has made a crucial error in his design. The wheel is too small for someone to walk upright inside. So that's the size of a person. The, the problem is, anyone standing in there, when you no, no, from, from here to here, is only if you want less than one. How many people go in there? Just one then. Two. Ignoring Bashar's weight worries, the carpenters decide to make the wheel even larger. The wheel is the power source of the crane. To achieve maximum lift, medieval crane builders had two options. Build the wheel small and turn it by hand from the outside, or build it large and put people inside. A large wheel had one big advantage. A large diameter and a small axle gave it a high ratio of gearing. It could lift heavier loads, but a heavier wheel could also break the crane. Ready? Mm -hmm. The team have opted for a wheel that people can walk inside. One this size will need 156 precision joints. On three, two, 
Three. At nearly four storeys high, the mast and jib arm contain the heaviest timbers. Trying to work it on a balance point so that you can use its own weight to move it around. If you try brute force, it just doesn't work. So you, so you have to get it balanced up properly and slide it on rollers or levers. Two. Three. There she goes. Most of the crane will be pinned together with wooden pegs, but a few crucial components will be made of wrought iron. To make these, Julian has hired French blacksmith and medieval machinery expert Roland Fanari. Roland is following a long tradition. In medieval times, every cathedral building site had its forge. Here, the blacksmith hammered out tools for the workers and parts for machinery. His expertise was vital for the safe construction of a cathedral crane. Like medieval blacksmiths, Roland uses ancient techniques, such as stopping rust with cow horn. That's been more than a thousand degrees. And after that, I will seal my metal with cow horn to prevent the rust coming in uh, with the moisture of the wood. This pin forms the pivot point at the bottom of the mast on which the whole crane will rotate. In medieval times, metal was rare. It had to be used sparingly. Most of the crane will be pinned with wooden pegs. The exception is the wheel rim where these joints will have to carry the weight of two people. The jib arm of the crane will turn on a circular wooden bearing sitting inside the collar at the top of the base. Uh, be careful, then you have six mil more. Met le centre. Il fait un nouveau, comme ça. It's a critical part. For the crane to turn smoothly, the bearing must be perfectly round. This will require precision carpentry. If your circle is not perfect, you know, it's like having a wheel with a bump, you know. It won't turn round. That's the underside, that's where we see what's going on in it. Tonight, everyone is working late. Bashar is feeling anxious about the weight of the enlarged tread wheel. He's calculating whether the crane will be strong enough to carry it. Roland is putting the finishing ironwork on the bearing. Oh, shit. The metal rings will shrink when cooled, stopping the wood from splitting. Having completed his computer projections, Bashar's worst fears about the weight of the tread wheel are confirmed. He thinks it is twice as heavy as it should be. The original wheel was assumed to be a ton. The new wheel is, in my estimate, close to two tons. Um, when you add that, to the added dead weight of the wood, you start developing too much bending on the mast itself. If Bashar is right, the crane will probably break. Daylight brings Bashar a new set of problems. Basha, come here, we've got another problem. <laughs> no. Eight, zero, five, yeah. that way. Oh, that's seven, nine, five, that way. Was it perfectly round before? It shrinks across the grain and shrinks very little down the grain. The it's from the heat of the iron? The heat of the iron has speeded up the shrinking. Oh, my goodness. Of course. Ah. So what we should have done is cut an oval, yeah. an egg shape. Yeah, to compensate for it. I'd like to just make sure that we establish a, a very clear sequence of events that once the... the to add to his troubles, he faces a mutinous crew. It's hand over. Stones into the arch. That's it? Bashar is keen to discuss the plan of attack. The builders just want to get on with the job. Drawings never seem to be that clear, and snags are always hit. 
and we have to change things appropriately as, uh, as we carry on. Well, they're like football commentators, aren't they? You know, they talk about it, but they don't play. Yeah. The tread wheel is nearly complete, and it is huge. But for Roland, the medieval expert, it is still not big enough. You're telling me the this is too small? It's too small to, to run, run from the inside. Right. This wheel is too big. If anything wrong is going to happen to the screen, this wheel is going to break the screen backwards. If we make it any bigger, it's going to be heavier. If this screen can carry this wheel safely, I'll be happy with the first one to get inside here. OK? And you will see then physically you will be not if, able to if, work for an hour. And if I'm it. wrong, I'll be the first to come and say, Roland, you know, I was wrong. You're right. This wheel is too small. Oh. OK? How many but, pack but if, of beer you own me? How many, do you, how many do you want? Oh, enough for the whole guys. Julian's design put all the weight of the crane on the bottom of the mast. Bashar is worried that if the mast leans forward, it will pull the base supports out of their sockets. To anchor them in, he wants to transfer the weight of the mast to the top of the base. The small bearing they've already made will be supplemented with a new, larger bearing. Both bearings will be attached halfway down the mast. The larger bearing will sit on top of the base and carry the entire weight of the crane. That's about it, Edge, I reckon. 30 mil and a teeth. That'll do. To soothe his growing anxiety, Bashar escapes to the nearby town of Coutances, which is dominated by a spectacular Gothic cathedral. 800 years after it was built, it is still the highest building for miles around. Damn impressive. It gives you this sense that there is almost a divine intervention here. You almost want to say, my God, it's not possible that people could have built this. Well, I've seen quite a few things that I wouldn't dare do today. They had a lot of balls. Medieval crane builders faced challenges that Bashar is only beginning to grasp. In medieval Europe, every town wanted a cathedral and every bishop wanted his to be the best. How to outdo the cathedral next door? Well, one way of doing this is certainly to build higher and therefore to be more impressive. It certainly feels that people were in competition. Medieval bishops competed with each other to build higher and higher cathedrals. In 1163, work started on Notre Dame in Paris. At 33 meters, its choir was a third higher than any previously attempted. Gothic architecture called for thin walls filled with large windows, a delicate structure which gave little support for the roof above. To keep Notre Dame standing, its architect pioneered a new invention, the flying buttress. Like rows of giant ribs, they stopped the arches in the center of the cathedral from falling down. The problem with the arch when you put it at the top of high walls is it creates a lot of thrust on the outside. To transmit the force from the top of the walls to the outer buttress, they introduced this concept of a flying buttress. And this transmits the force from the top of the wall to the outer buttress. This is why if you take out the flying buttress, the whole thing would collapse. Flying buttresses enabled the cathedral builders to go higher than ever before. 30 years after the completion of Notre Dame, Christianity was on the march. New cathedrals sprang up at Chartres, Reims, then Amiens, each one taller than the last. In 1225, work began on Beauvais. At 48 meters, this cathedral was tall enough to enclose a 14-story building. It has never been surpassed. It remains the highest cathedral choir in the world. The race to build high raised new engineering challenges. At heights over 30 meters, the builders experienced far greater wind speeds than they had encountered before, further complicating the tricky task of positioning stones. Working at these heights called for steady, powerful cranes.
the medieval crane builders are preparing for their first lift. To assemble their crane, they need to erect another crane, a tripod or A-frame. They've brought in rigging supervisor Wes Moore to make sure there are no hitches. The point that's scaring me the most is actually getting the pieces up. Is as everybody's pulling, somebody slips, two people drop the line, whole piece goes. It's not a precise science. To help erect the tripod, they've enlisted every spare, able bodied man in the village. All right, here we go. One, two, three. And do trois. 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 And do In less than 20 minutes, the tripod is in the air. Very, very pleased. This is the first big lift, second big lift is there, the rest of the crane. Cheers, boys. But before they can raise the mast and jib arm, there is one more problem to sort out. Bashar wants to make sure that the crane will rotate. The pivot point is the bearing halfway up the mast. Too much friction here, and the crane won't turn. My feeling was we yeah. put metal on metal, yeah, and then grease the interface, and this way we can reduce friction. When you will have with four, four ton in it, yeah, uh, the grease yeah, metal. will totally will squeeze out. To keep the grease in, uh, you need, for me, to make a, a kind of smooth washer yeah. full of grease, yeah. After that, you can compress, you have a kind of mattress, a soft okay. mattress full of grease, and this one will still move forever. Uh, to smart have a man. Fur. <laughs> Adopting Roland's idea, rope is wrapped around the collar. The top and sides are greased, ready for the bearing. The team are finally ready for the biggest operation of the project raising the mast and jib arm. What was a ton and a half to three quarters has now grown mysteriously to 2.2 tons and some. I translate. Alors ça, ça va être la partie la plus dangereuse de la journée puisqu'il y a deux tonnes et demi à lever. Hein? Once this mast starts to actually come off the ground and slides along, you'll notice that this doesn't exactly sit at a right angle. Black Sabbath to help. <laughs> Excellent. That's loud. great. <laughs> loud. Loud. Pulling on trois. Everybody ready? And two, trois. And two, trois. And two, trois. And two, trois. Okay, everybody all together now. And two, trois. And two, trois. And two, trois. Halfway through the lift, the team run into trouble. Come back to your post, yeah. Got that pin hooked up there on the on the side of the A-frame, so we need to shift the bottom over, I think, and uh, get it off there. Okay, guys, gonna need some help. You're gonna have to walk this back. Sixteen people are left hanging onto two tons of crane. Watch yourself. Wes needs to act quickly. Okay, give me some rope. I need to get under this bar. Right now we're coming across. And again. With the team under pressure, tempers start to fray. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. I don't think this is a good idea, huh? This is too much load on this thing. You're going to start pulling on the, on the legs. I'm not worried about it, but if you are, I'll take it off. Other <laughs> way! Yeah, it's off the pin. OK, yeah. everybody together!
<laughs> Once lined up, the whole two tons needs to be dropped precisely into position. I think the weight is on there. Yeah, I think so. Victory! <laughs> so I was particularly worried about how the base is going to take the load. Typically, wood, when it's overstressed, it, we, we, we say it screams at you, it starts cracking. Nothing at all. So, so far, it's doing very well. For Julian, it's a huge relief. His model is a step closer to reality. Because we're slightly behind schedule, we've had to get the wheel on as well today. I think that would have been a mammoth task. So it's early night for everybody, I think, and uh, we'll pick it up again in the morning. Only Bashar stays up. He's still worrying about tomorrow's lift of the wheel. Unfortunately, this uh, crane was designed for a one-ton wheel. Now that we have a two-ton wheel, all the forces have doubled. And this crane is not happy about it. If I were to just plot out the bending diagram, you can see what's happening. This red represents the amount of tension on the mast from bending backwards. And you can see it peaks right around the center region right here. And this amount of stress is twice what this post was originally designed to take. In their pursuit to build the ultimate crane, the team have pushed the design to its limit. Early morning on site. Everyone is concerned about the wheel. Well, the wheel should be lighter, for sure. A lot lighter, a lot smaller. Worried that the wheel might weigh two tons, double the load capacity he's calculated for the crane, Basha insists that the wheel is weighed. Est-ce que tu peux me dire combien elle pèse la roue? La roue est fait une tonne quatre. One ton and four hundred kilos. One and a half ton. The wheel is still half a ton more than it should be. I told you it's more than a ton. Yeah, but I told you it was not two tons. <laughs> yeah, this is already one point four. Plus, you're gonna add the two hangers on it, so it's probably more than one and a half tons. You but, lose, my friend. But Cross Jay, Cross you, you, all around. No, you <laughs> lose too. Okay, so, so it's one and a half tons, so we split. We, yeah. we, we buy them beer and croissant. Okay. <laughs> one and a half, I, I feel a little bit better. Uh -huh. I still think it's a problem. Bashar's relief soon gives way to another concern. He's learned that the team are planning to pull the wheel up using the back of the crane as a support. To lift a one and a half ton wheel, they must pull down with an equal force. If they go ahead, it will put a three-ton load on the crane. Up until yesterday, we had the tripod. Yeah, but the tripod was never to be used for the wheel. Never. Well, never, okay. never, never. All right, apparently, yeah, that's the case because it's not, it's not well, here you, today. You couldn't use it anyway. Think about the structure off, of it. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even go off the wheel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But at least it would have given us an option. And if I'm understanding what you're proposing to do, the screen will most likely break if you do that. With no time to come up with an alternative plan, Bashar has no option but to urge caution. What I'm proposing to do is have a very careful sequence of events that mm. will gradually apply the load. So in case we see anything wrong happening to the crane, we can stop it there and then mm. and try to address it. We're about there now. Happy? Yep. Happy. Today is a day of many tests. The first is whether the crane will turn. Oh, the oh I see. OK, <laughs> moving. The bearing moves easily on the greased rope. Bashar's concern is in contrast to the timber framer's exuberance. They are keen to get the wheel in the air. You're going to pull the this um, rope tight oh. first. Yeah, well, snug. Yeah. Snug tight, okay. And then you're going to have four sides pulling to lift the wheel slowly. Yep. 
And if we notice anything that's starting to crack too much... We'll increase the tension back on this side. We'll increase the tension back... If it back, don't work, the design can... was wrong, man. We've lost. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. We have, we have too, no, 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 no. We have too much to lose at this stage. One, two, three... Ignoring Bashar's methodical plan, they start the lift. Hang on, some people Whoa. aren't pulling here. I'd like to see if there's any sign of distress and just yeah, yeah. abort the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bashar's attempts to call a halt are angrily rebuffed. This, something is going to go wrong here. Let's just relax. Because you're in let's charge just, let's just... Rigger who knows his job. Exactly. So why don't you let him take over exactly. and not have you telling him his job? Okay? That's, that's you're a fine. structural engineer, not that, that's fine. somebody who works on the building site. Thank that's, you. That's fine. Right. One, one person is going to call a shot. I only have one concern, which yeah. is breaking the crane, OK? You, you have only one concern, which is the yeah. safety of the rigging operation. Yes. I'd like to have a veto. You call all the shots. Yeah. But if I feel that something is breaking in the rig, I'd like to call you to stop it and abort it and let the wheel down. Enough. Okay? It's only going yeah. a couple of feet. If it's breaking the crane, well, no, here in, in the crane the can't stand it, can it? We don't want to break the crane. Okay, my concern is that if we see something going wrong, we let the wheel down immediately yeah, right. so we well, can have a chance to fix it. This is going to be evident here in the next three inches. We're all, okay, guys. Rock and roll. We're going to put this puppy in the air. One, two, three. Are you happy about the way it's going up? Shut the camera off. I really don't want to talk about it. One, two, three. Uh, the outside is going to go up higher. A lot more. One, two, three. One, two. Now together. If you hold on a second, let's keep going while we're at it because everybody's going to get tired and then we're going to drop this damn wheel and then we won't even have to worry about it. One, two, three. Two. One, two, three. Two. One, two, three. Two. Hold it there. One, two. Three. That's more than high enough. More than high enough. OK, we're taking our line all the way around the outside. We're going underneath this line. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. The wheel is in the air, and the crane is still standing. But the timber framers need to get the wheel into position. In their rush, they have generated new problems. Just catching on the side. The axle won't go into the hole, and they have cut the slot for the rear hanger in the wrong place. Oh, it's really worthwhile measuring bits of wood when you do a housing. I did! We've agreed this morning on a plan, a very carefully and well thought out plan to lift the wheel. I spoke to Wes about it, the guy that's doing the rigging is all clear. The next thing I know, what the hell is going on? Well, you're only a structural engineer, what the hell do you know? OK? I don't know. How do you like it right now? Give it another kick. That's as far under as it's going to go. That's, that's right under there. I have no idea what they're doing. I think it's those pulleys keeping it from... See the pulleys, right? They should be set over there about a foot more. Yeah. And it's directly below the pulleys. Yeah. It's not allowing it to go in. The blocks at the top are stopping the actual wheel getting into the into its axle point on the down arm. So they need to re-rig the blocks a foot further this way so it will help pull the whole thing in. In an attempt to push the axle into the hole, Wes repositions the pulley blocks. You gonna try and sink it in the hole now? Yeah. All right, I'm on. OK. Ready? Yep. Right. That's the one. Oh, it's the one. We're home. That's in. Tomorrow's the big day when they must put their crane to the test. An anxious night of planning lies ahead. The big day dawns when the team will try to use their crane for the first time. The wheel still isn't working and Bashar has virtually given up hope. Well, I'm still pissed off from yesterday. It botched the lift of the wheel. Instead of a perfect baby, we have yeah. half a perfect baby now. It didn't work. We've put enough hard work into it to make it work. We're not far away. 
about another half an hour, and I think once the D-rig's done and all the straps are off, it'll start rotating. UP. Bashar leaves the workers to get on with the job. He wants to solve one last mystery. How did medieval carpenters lift a crane to the top of a cathedral? They must have figured out a way of lifting it up in pieces, in smaller pieces, using smaller cranes or maybe even windlass. As the cathedral rose higher, the crane would have risen with it. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, holes in the walls that they've used to build scaffolding off of the wall itself. The scaffolding was suspended directly from the wall as the wall got higher. Bashar believes they used this scaffolding to support the crane. On a medieval building site, the crane operators worked under pressure. At some medieval sites, stone was brought in by cart at the rate of four tons an hour. The crane men not only had to lift this to heights up to 130 meters, but each stone had to be precisely positioned. The person in charge of the operation was the master mason. Unlike today's architects, master masons were men who got their hands dirty. They started as apprentices and worked their way up through the ranks. The heart of their domain was the tracery room. It was the drawing office of the medieval construction company. Here the master mason would set out on a specially prepared floor full-size drawings of each and every stone which needed to be carved by the masons in the quarry. It would be a white washed floor using graphite dust to brush in. He would set out every single stone full size. The greatest artistic challenge for the stonemasons was to carve the intricate stonework that adorned Gothic cathedrals. A rose window could contain over 200 separate stones. Each one had to be designed so that it was no bigger than the cathedral crane could lift. They had to produce what were known as moulds and templates. Each one of these would be traced out on top of the tracery drawing. This would be then numbered and taken off to the quarry where they would start producing the stones to exactly fit the templates. Carving stones was a skilled and highly paid job and the stone carvers received a bonus every time they completed a window or arch. The most complicated pieces of a tracery window could take as long as two weeks to carve. They were then sent on to the cathedral. When the stone arrived from the quarry, the first thing that the builders had to do was to lay the stone out and check that it fit. The backs of the stones would all carry the quarryman's marks, the mason's marks, and this would show that if any mason was not performing properly, that he could be chastised or told to do it again. They would then bring the stone up to the walls of the cathedral, where they would be built in as the cathedral progressed up from ground level. The safe handling of these valuable assets depended on the maneuverability of the crane and the skill of the workers. A dropped stone could mean the destruction of weeks of work, if not the death of several men. You've had two guys in the wheel, operating the wheel, lifting up and down. Maybe a guy on top of the crane, making sure that it isn't going to fall over or collapse. And then probably two guys maintaining, keeping the thing running. Because obviously when it stops, the work stops as well. Slapped wrist time for the crane men. How difficult these cranes were to keep running, the team are about to find out. Now the one and a half ton wheel has been added to the crane. Is Roland's rope bearing still up to the job? You gonna see if we can turn it? Yeah. We're coming down. One, two, three. No. Oh. Yeah, we did a good job of bending the bar, though. <laughs> Too much friction, no? Maybe we're just cutting back into the rope. Bashar has let the influence of a medieval expert overrule his engineering knowledge. Well, the whole axle is just leaning backwards right now towards the heavy load. The weight of the wheel has pushed the bearing into Roland's rope mattress. No amount of force will turn the crane. I've never seen this detail before. Unfortunately, I bought it on belief. And you can see it's just compressing the hell out of it. I mean, the rope is so soft. There's, there's no way in hell you can move this metal now. It just gripped completely in the rope. 
The original detail was trying to put steel plates on both sides with a lot of grease in between. And I'm applying force. And no matter how much you clamp it, you'll always be able to get it to move. The crane might not be able to turn, but the team are sure it can lift. The moment has arrived to put it to the test. Can they maneuver a keystone weighing 90 kilograms onto a mason scaffold? Julian, the crane's designer, is first into the wheel. Very good. It was very safe in it. And it's very, very easy to move. It comes as a real surprise that something so big can be controlled with such precision. As the crane cannot rotate, they have to pull the stone into position. Keep going, keep going. They have proved that they can lift the everyday stones of a medieval building site. But their goal was to lift a town, the size of the largest blocks in a medieval cathedral. They believe they can outdo that. They have decided to attempt to lift a one and a half ton van. Front end's coming off. No, keep going. Go on, Dan. Free float. In the air. Fantastic. <laughs> Very pleased. Very pleased. Yeah. Look at all those joints. I can't <laughs> see them opening up at all anywhere. Didn't even fall, didn't, didn't creak, groan, nothing. No. After two weeks of hard work, for the first time since the Middle Ages, a cathedral crane lifts again. Look what they've managed to do. They've, they've built a monstrous crane that can lift a lot of load. I mean, my guess it can pull up to maybe even four tons. Very little human effort. It's so easy to operate. We've made a huge crane <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, we've actually got an object that I think everybody's incredibly pleased with. The team has shown how medieval carpenters might have built giant, human-powered cranes. 800 years ago, the increased lifting power of these treadwheel cranes enabled a new generation of cathedrals to be built across Europe. The glorious structures they raised planted the Christian faith firmly in the heart of every town and city. Christianity was sealed as the dominant faith of the continent for centuries to come. No time to forget next tonight, it's Wogan's Perfect Recall.